Let the church say amen. Let the church say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Is God good? Let, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Now don't freeze up on me. Talk, talk. For him, nobody talk you back. Has God ever done anything for you? Sure don't sound like it. It don't. Listen to that. I mean, being honest, listen to yourself. Yeah, he has. And you act like he, whatever he did, it was accidentally. He didn't do it on purpose. Let, let me ask you a question. You, you think that you got up accidentally this morning? So, so our reason for being here is to exalt, to lift up, and praise the Lord. Now, God knows every one of us got some things on our heart. But you cannot praise God burdened down with the cares of this world. You, you can't you can't worship him. You 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 worried some somebody done walked off and left a pot on the stove. You, it's gonna burn. Ain't no need to worry about that. It's it gonna burn. You ain't gonna eat it when you get home. Just pray that it don't burn the house down. Other little ailments some folk they got pains. You had you would have those pains if you stayed home. You you'd have them. Folk talk about me. They do that in the grocery store. You don't know it. They talk about you in the store. They ne they don't even know you. When we come in the presence of the Lord, which we did this morning, we need to lay down our cares, lay down our burdens. They real. I know they real. And this is relevant. We all have these. This is relevant. But but you cannot have an act, actual honest engagement with God without laying down your cares. Now let me tell you something. This is Bible. You can go look at every, every text. Everybody that Jesus met that had cares were changed. They were changed. It didn't say move the cares, but they were changed. One of the most in intriguing stories that I remember when Jesus met the woman at the well that had all of them husbands. And she tried to talk, you know, she tried to talk circles around the masses. She said, I, I don't have no husband. He said, I know. The one you got, with, you went down, ain't you? You ain't fooling nobody. I know that ain't you. But, but when she left him, her heart was changed. Now, I want to tell you this this morning. If you hear and you make an honest surrender to God, he will change you. But if you don't make a surrender, you know what surrender, that's giving up. You got to give up. He'll change. Anybody come to hear a word from God this morning? Ooh, we are gonna have a good time. I see our new converts here. I see members who want to be new converts. I see Mr. Wendell here. We're gonna have a good time in the Lord. Got your Bibles, and you know I was gonna I was gonna sing, Mr. Wendell, but I don't want you to leave. So stay with me, Wendell. We ain't going to ask Brother Smith to sing, have mercy, have mercy. <laughs> uh, this old school, this old school sermon, so you need to. Thank you, Brother. But man, she'll take care of me, don't you? He wants something. Whatever it is you want, Robert, I don't have. Silver and gold have I none. <laughs> uh, turn to Micah chapter six. Now, I was going to I was going to uh there is a significant part of this. I know we, we that 
Brokoff, is that like Matthew? No, no. I, I know you're confused. Probably never heard it before. Do like Brother Smith over here. Go to the index. Look at it. <laughs> huh? Yeah. We're going minor prophets. Straight up minor prophets. I hear pages turning. I'm, I'm not in a hurry. I do want to say this while you're turning your pages. You folk that are going to the dinner at Northside, it's not 1230. So if you go at 1230, you're going to be just standing around. It's at 1 o'clock. The monthly fellowship is at 245. And that whole program of the monthly fellowship will consist of a pep rally that we will be doing for the national lectureship, which will be held in Orlando in April. We're on the line now? So it's, the dinner is at 1. The program is at 245. The whole program will consist of a pep rally for the National Lectureship, which will be held in Orlando in April. That's what that's going to be about. You're going to see, uh, you're going to see some singing. Uh, hear some singing, rather. You're going to have some door prizes given away. Some of you will have a trip, a chance to win, uh, stay at the hotel where the lectureship is. Couple of things like that. It'll take the whole. It'll encompass the whole, whole program. So that's where we are today with that. But you're most welcome to go. This evening service. This evening worship service will start at 5:30. That's okay. Now I know these brethren. They're gonna be here on time because they want to go home and see the playoffs. So sisters, let's get here. And let's don't hold them up. We won't frustrate them with, with the football. Uh, but if you have your Bible, Micah chapter 6. I, I was going to do, this is an old school sermon, but, but this thing has been bothering me. And, and some folk don't believe, but, but God will just... He's got his way, but, 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 but can't let the Holy Spirit, it just, he won't let you rest. So I thought I would go back and do this. And I'm, if I don't get through all of this, uh, it'll be okay. But there's something here you need to see. Members, non-members, new converts, children, young people, there's something in this text you need to see. I'm going to be reading to you. Uh, somebody left this on my desk. I get more Bibles left on my desk. Ain't got no name in it. And I don't even like reading that either, but since I studied that, I'm going to use it. It's a new international version. I don't want the new. I want the old international version. But the Bible says now, in verse 1, Listen to what the Lord says. You on the line? Stand up. Now, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Something going on here. He said, Here, O mountain, the Lord's accusation. Listen, your everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. Lord, have mercy. He has lodged a charge against Israel. My people, this is God's people. What have I done to you? Now, here's what I want this to resonate with. Let this be God speaking to you as an individual, okay? For in, the word, in other words, if I replace, he said, Coffee, what have I done to you? 
He said, how have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt. Some of you probably said, no, that can't be to me. Some of us are still in our Egypts. God has brought us from our Egypts. But Egypt have a strange pull on us. We want to go right back into Egypt. So God is telling them, so I bought you up. He said, I redeemed you from the land of slavery. Don't you remember when they were in bondage? They cried out to God constantly, and he heard their calls, and he sent them a deliverance. He said, I did that. I redeemed you from the land of slavery. He said, I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. He said, my people remember what back like the king of Moab counseled. And, and remember Balaam, the son of Be Be Bezor, answer. Remember the journey of the Shittim to Gilgal so that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. In other words, I need to let you know, because some, you know, some of us soon forget that we 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 we're like that old slogan. What have you done for me lately? He said, I, I need to take you back down memory lane. In other words, this is old school. He said, With what shall I come before the Lord? Now this is. Israel responded. He said, and bow down before exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? In other words, God said, what have I done to you? You know everything that I've done for you, uh, coffee. I've, I've delivered you. I've, I've blessed you every morning. You don't have to struggle whether or not you're going to get up. I wake you up. And so now they want to respond. Well, well, Lord, what you want us to do? You know, because some of us play like that. I don't know what I should be doing. They say, shall we bow down before you and exalt you? Shall I come before you with burnt offerings? Would, would you be happy with that? Uh, with a calf, a year old, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with ten thousands of what well, Lord, what, how can we make you happy? You ever thought about that? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? Oh, come on, you're being facetious. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. And so now Micah responds. Let me tell you something, Israel. He has showed you, old man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? That's going to be the lesson. What does the Lord require of you? I'm not through reading yet, but I'm going to come. I'm going to try to get through all this. If I don't, you leave your address, I'll mail you a copy. Uh, he says, what does the Lord require of you? Three things. I'm going to develop these three, I hope, before the day is over. To act justly. To love mercy. To walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord require? You ready? Fasten your seatbelt. I don't want you to fall out. You're getting ready to speed up. This is interesting text. The idea of what it is that God requires of Israel. 
And, and, and in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, you don't have to go through these. You can jot them down if you'd like. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says, And now Israel, what doeth the Lord thou God require thee, but to fear the Lord God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and keep his commandments. Now this word, uh, require, in the Hebrew, the same word can be used for several meanings. Did you know that? In Deuteronomy, what I just quoted to you, the word there does not mean judgment, but it means to ask. What does the Lord ask of you? God doesn't have to ask us anything or anything. So we know that that application of require is not the word used in Micah. Because God's not asking us for anything. But the other meaning for the word is that it's like a judiciary. What is it that God expects from us? Do you believe that God expects anything from you? Certainly he does. He, he has a right to expect from us. Uh, let me just give you a little history. I'm going to get to three, these three points. I tell you it might take me a few minutes. Let me give you a little history to develop an idea here. In Leviticus chapter 1, now you don't have to turn there either. You can just, you can just jot Leviticus 1 down. Actually, I'm going to give you Leviticus 1, 1 through 13. That's old, that's old Testament. A lot of these Old Testaments, you know, we, 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 some of us, we, we haven't read them. We don't understand how they try us. We don't understand how a lot of the writing there is strictly applicable to us. But here is the writing, Moses. The Bible said, now the Lord called to Moses, Leviticus chapter uh, uh, 1. He said, then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of the meeting. I want to show you something to build a foundation to show you what God requires. He said, speak to the children of Israel and to say to them, when one of you shall bring an offering of livestock of the herd, he said, bring it. He said, and that offering should be, uh, if it should be burnt, let him offer it a male. God is always called a sacrifice and offering. Amen. So everyone that came to worship this morning ought to have bought a... Now, here's how particular God is. He says, if it's a male, he can't have any blemishes. In other words, don't bring me no blind sheep. I want the best you got. Don't bring me one of your calves if he's limping. You keep that one. Bring me what's best. In other words, when we come to worship God, this is required of us, we bring our best. Don't come in half-hearted. I know some days you're so pretty, you got so much makeup, you don't want to sing and crack the makeup. You better sing. God doesn't want second hand. He didn't give us a second hand. God gave us his best. The Bible says he gave his only begotten son. In Matthew chapter 17, when they were met on the mountain of transfiguration, Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. He said, if I will, let us build three tabernacles. The Bible says, while he yet spake, a cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud. This is not just my son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's what God wants to be with us. Well pleased. You should be well pleased with God. Not accidentally. Oh, the day uh, church is in Africa. Oh, I go to this church. I need, I need to get to church. No, 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 no. You know what? That should be forefront. That should be the first thing in your, 
in, in fact, when you leave today, you should be planning for the next worship. Because God has given us his best. He expects that from us. He told Moses, he said, if you, if you, if you bur bring a burnt sacrifice, it needs to be a male animal, and that animal, just because you're bringing him burnt, he should be without blemish. In other words, I want the best you got. Don't bring me nothing secondhand. In Zechariah chapter 7, in the verses 8, just laying my foundation. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, Execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress widows, do not oppress the fatherless, the alien or the poor. He said, And let none of your plan be evil. He said, And have a, a clean heart with your brethren. That's what God is talking about. The church. We should, we should have that. These are the things that Malachi said we should do. We should speak truth to our neighbors. We should give judgment we should have justice and peace. He said that, and let none of us think evil in our hearts. You know how some people go around, everybody they see, they don't even know them. They don't like them. You see what he had on the day? He looks silly in there. No, should, we, should, we should be thinking a bunch of foolishness. He said, and these things the Lord hates. So it should be positive. Now let me go if I hadn't used all my time. Let me develop these three thoughts. You, you okay? Now, I'm not going to develop these with opinion. It's old school. Everything I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you where to go find. In fact, we're going to go today together. Is that Okay. Here's what the Lord requires of the church. We're God's Israel today. The church is the, is the body of Christ. The church of Christ is the body of Christ. Jesus died for the church. When he came upon the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, whom do men say that I am? They gave all kinds of answers. Peter stood up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this rock, the confession that Peter made, Jesus promised to build a church. And he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice what I just told you. He promised to build the church. Matthew chapter 16. He promised to build a church. Some of our friends are saying he hadn't built it yet. He's built it. That body of Christ, the church, has been built. Here is proof positive. Matthew chapter 16, in fact, verse number 28. Jesus makes this statement. He said, there be some of you talking to those disciples, standing here, thou shall not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. If the kingdom ain't here, some of them guys still living. They'd be, they'd be 3,500 years old. Now, I know we got some of our young blacks with their pants hanging down, look like they're 3,500 years old, but it ain't them. Jesus said, some of you all standing right here shall not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's not proof positive. Or something. Well, just a minute. Just a minute. I hadn't got to that. 
when I just gave you that scripture a minute ago, Matthew chapter 17, when Jesus taking Peter, James, and John on the high mountain, mountain of transfiguration, Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. He said, if thou will, let us be a what? I just gave you an example of a tabernacle as a place of worship. While he was speaking, God overshadowed two of those tabernacles. Elijah and Moses. He told Peter, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. So that's the Lord expects us to hear his son. I know that some of some, some religious bodies have relegated to Jesus just being a good man. Jesus is a Messiah. He is our Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And, none, and nobody else. I know that we have, um, uh, my, my, my ham is dead. When he died, he died all over. He was just like Rover. But when Jesus died, he was resurrected forever. And so we are to hear him. Now, you ready? You haven't started yet, bro? Oh, man, I got to let you finish the foundation. Come on. So, what should we be observant? What should we be thinking? What I know that even in the church, the Lord's body, we have turned some things into rituals. Amen. It, they, they're not what God expected them. Sometimes we turn into ritual. One of them is this. One of them is this. We get up here and say all kind of foolish stuff. No, 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 no. This is the Lord's body. You know what a great time to repent is when you come here. You know a great time for you to repent publicly or in your heart is when you come here. This little juice is not just juice. It's an emblem. It represents Jesus' blood. The bread at, at represents his body. I see people take, giving, giving Junior a bite. He bite. Now, 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 you you sin. You in sin. You drink half of it and give Junior half to drink. No, no, no. You and Junior messed up. The cup, the Bible, Jesus said, drink ye all up. It don't say, you drink some, give Junior some so you'll be quiet. No, you make Junior be quiet. Raise him. Oh, getting mighty quiet in here. Danny, I tell you, you're going to have to say amen because this old school. This old school. Getting mighty quiet, Danny. You're going to have to say amen. Don't leave me hanging, Danny. We have turned things into rituals. What does God expect? One of them is this. You know what the other one is? Worship. Worship. We were just talking about this yesterday in our preacher's meeting. We turned, folk were asking questions. Because we turned worship into a ritual. We'll come in, we'll do anything, we'll talk, we'll walk around. This is sacred. That's why under the law, everybody couldn't go in the holiest of holy because you weren't clean enough. Now we come in, we got to go around and let everybody see us. Here, I'm here. Take me out. It ain't about you. If you think it's about you, you're here for the wrong reason. When we come in, we ought to hide ourselves behind the cross. I don't want you to see me. I want you to see Jesus. I can't do nothing for you. I can't save you. We turn it into a ritual. It's everything but that. When we sing, we're not singing to one another. The Bible says, speaking to yourself, songs and hymns, spirituals, singing, making melody in your heart to who? To who? It's not a 
about me. It's not about it's not about us. We're not on display. What does the Lord require? Then some folks say, well, you know, at least I got the church. Whoopee, what you want, a chest or a badge pin on it? Let me tell you, one of the three things that is required that I mentioned to you in Micah, and I'm going to show it to you in the New Testament just shortly, didn't include coming to church. However, in coming to church is inclusive in that. We were talking about this yesterday. I think it's great we have media. Hello to you folks on, faith, on live stream. But you know what? You cannot serve God without being in his presence. Listen at this. I didn't put this in the Bible. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there I'm in the midst. Mm, Facebook. God's people have a place to assemble. He assembles here, Brother Campbell, because here we exalt him. I love this technology. I don't want to be, I don't want to be. I'm just old school. If you're going to keep, somebody said yesterday, y'all preachers need to keep it real. Okay, I'm going to keep it real. If you're going to exalt God, you got to be in his house. You can't be sitting on the sofa with your bedroom slippers and PJs on talking about, praise the Lord, I see y'all. No, no, come out here and praise him. Come out here and praise him. I, I mean, I love you folks, and, and we get about 1,300 hits a uh, Every Sunday. But but you know what? If you want, if you're sincere about what you're doing, come into worship. You got ESPN on waiting on football and you watching us. How you gonna do both? You getting ready to tee off on on nine, you got us on Facebook. Hold, hold on, y'all hold, I gotta tee. No, 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 no. Your mind should be here. Tending worship service is important. It's essential to obeying God. In, in, in Hebrews 10.25, it says that we should not forsake the assembly. And so if, 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 if we're really concerned, you know what not mean? You shall not forsake. You know what that mean? Yesterday when I pulled up to that gas pump, they had a couple of them blocked off. I was kind of frustrated. I was on E. Now I need some gas. The guy told me, you cannot park there. I didn't start at, what do you mean not? What does not mean? You had to move. Why does it become difficult when we come to serving God? It's a, you shall not. You know what not means? You cannot do that. It's not, you're not justified in doing it. Some folks just stay home, just go, well, you know, Lord, understand my heart. I worked out, we got tired. I'm stay home the rest of the day. You can't do that. <laughs> Excuse me. He said, not for second. Now, here's the reason. Not only is it good for you, but it's good for me. Not because I'm the preacher, but because I am a brother. You have a responsibility to me. To, he said, and we should consider one another to provoke. How you going? Well, you. Like my old buddy, he did go on. He, he couldn't, he, 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 he couldn't use it. He couldn't say provoke. He said, you're going to vote me? <laughs> provoke. Encourage. How are you going to encourage me? How are you going to do it? Now, let me tell you something. God requires this, Brother Denson, not coffee. 
God requires it. How you going to encourage me? And I said in our Bible class, every one of us in here have a certain amount of influence over somebody else. You may not even know you got influence over. Influence is one of the most powerful characteristics you can have. And you don't know who you had influence over. So if you don't know you got influence over me and you start staying on, guess what? I say, it must be all right, Danny, doing it. What is it that God requires? Lord have mercy, I ain't got no. You got your Bible? Let's, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. I, I, I like scripture because you ought to hear what he said. He said a lot of stuff. Well, you no, know, I'm just saying it because God said it first. I'm repeating what God said. It, it, it's, I'm, it's not original for me. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Don't get afraid, brother. I know you're afraid to go to Ephesians 5 because I'm talking about husband loving the wives. That, that one of them that always shake us up. Husband love your wife. We ain't going to bother that today. We, but we are going to start in verse number 15, Campbell, when you get there. Ephesians 5, 15. We're we going to be all right. If we don't get it all, we'll do it another day. Test. So what does the book say there, Brother Campbell? See then that he walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. <laughs> You sure that's what that say? Yes, sir. He said, see then, we walk what? Circumspectly. What, what does that mean? Maybe that's why people don't walk. So, what does, does that mean that you, it's a limp in the side? Is it, what, what does circumspectly mean? Okay. Yeah, you know, you know what circum... You, you, when you walk, that's why most of us get hit in the head and robbed and Carjack, we, we don't walk circumspect. You gotta know what's where you're going, what your what's about your surroundings. Some of us just now just, some of us just do things that you, you out you out visiting and you get thirsty. You you drive to the liquor store to buy a Coca Cola. That's the only place they sell Coca Cola? <laughs> and then get in an argument with the man because we, we don't sell coke without bourbon well, I, I, my preacher said I can get I ain't told you go get no coke and no liquor store Paul said see then that you walk walk, walk with vision Walk with a purpose. Know what your surroundings are about. Know, you know why? Because you, you can make an impression on other people. People are watching. But most importantly, God is watching. He can see all the stuff you do at home behind closed doors. So he said, walk circumspectly and walk, what? Not as a fool, but as wise. But Kim, if you call somebody a fool, they'd be ready to fight you. But yet the scripture calls them, if you're not walking certain, you are a fool. That's what God said. He said, see then that you walk. Be aware. Just don't drift through life. Some folks just drift into life. Now let me tell you. Most of us had some goals in life. You may not achieve them, but you had goals, didn't you? Some of us still working on our goals. It's okay to make plans. Spiritually, you ought to have goals. You ought to have goals. You should not be satisfied with just, you know, I'm going to text today, honey. You're going, yeah, I'm selling back. If they sing you. I don't count it all them towels. <laughs> no, you, you come to worship. Engage. Yes. 
If you don't walk circumspectly and don't engage, God is calling you a fool. You got to engage. Read Campbell. Redeeming the time. Doing what? Redeeming the time. Lord. <laughs> Redeeming the time for this reason. Because, because what? Because the days are evil. Now, I think all of us in here got testimony. We're living in some critical evil time. He said redeem. What's redeeming? Most of you, if, if most of you folk under 45, you, you don't know nothing about redeeming. I remember when I had, used to go out and look in ditches against what they call, they, then not, all of a sudden we got sophisticated now it's soda. It ain't soda. They, they, it's pop. You get them pop bottles. You go get them once and rinse them out. Especially on the weekend. So you can have enough money. You sell them. You only get a penny. Some of them two for a penny. So you have enough money to get lunch in school next week. That was redeeming. They would buy them back for a value. We are bought back. We are bought with a price. That price is the blood of Jesus. He's redeemed us. And even though we're in the world, we're not of the world. We're not in it. And, and you have to understand the dynamics of that because God wants to do things with us, but we got to realize what is our responsibility to God. What does he want us to do? Amen? Yes, sir. Okay. One of them, and, and, and when we miss this, he expects us to grow spiritually. We can do everything else but grow spiritually. Some folk been trying for years. Growth is stunning. Amen. We, we have, you have to make a commitment. That was what it was all about last, last Sunday. When you make a commitment, stuff just doesn't fly over your head. Amen. You, all of us in here who are married, let that resonate. Whether you realize it or not, you made a commitment. I know someone, I ain't made no commitment to her. Yeah, you did. I tell you what, just treat her like you do the Lord. Decide that you're not going to go home for four or five days. I bet, I bet she'll let you know about the commitment. Yeah, and then, and then, then when you get back after you've been gone four or five days, just walk in. I'm okay, honey. They kidnapped me, but I escaped. <laughs> you get the taste slapped out your mouth. <laughs> you got to make a commitment. Church, we have to make a commitment. You have to, when you have obligations, you are expected to be accountable for those. Yes, sir. I learned that when I was young, and I was from a poor family. My dad and mama, and that's their business. They had 11 children. That was their business. We had chores. We, I had to bring the cold in. My mother had a, my wife can tell me when we first went, my mother had an old stove that you cook with wood and coal. Heat the oven. And on top of that, we had one of them. Y'all know them. I know the young people talking about, you crazy, yes, man. We had a big yes, pot belly stove. Yes, you feed that coal in it. That was for heat. The other was for cooking. And if my responsibility was to get the coal in, and I decided, I ain't getting no cold. I'm tired. The whole house suffered. Nobody got to eat. Nobody got to take a hot bath. And them brethren of mine were threatening me. 
And daddy, Lord have mercy. I'd rather my brother beat my daddy would beat you with whenever he found. I'm what I'm saying is that taught me responsibility and accountability. When people, when you have a job, God expects you to do it. It's not based on whether it's popular, but I would do it, you know, but a whole lot of people don't show up. But did you volunteer for it? That's like me going down in the police department. I sign up for it. They send me out to write tickets and rest drunks. I go back and tell Captain Cap, when no, no drunks and people out there run the light today. I think I'm going to sit here and keep you company. You know that ain't right. If you volunteer, people expect you to serve. But more importantly, God expects you to serve. Getting quiet, Lord him. Yeah, yeah, I told you this is old school. Lord him mercy. There is a certain way that we have to abide in the in the word of God. And just because you are long for the ride doesn't mean that you're saved. Brett Campbell, we gotta we gotta read this. See, folks folk think I'm making up stuff, trying to mess with them. I ain't trying to mess with nobody in mind. Watch what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 7. And the verse is 21. Read it, Campbell. Everyone to say unto me, Lord, Lord. Take your time. He said, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord. Because you know some folk really do that. Yes. Hardship for them, Lord, Lord, why me? But Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall do what? To enter into the kingdom of heaven. Enter the kingdom of heaven. Who? Who's going to enter? He that doeth the will but he God. that doeth. Now, I'm not an English teacher. Do is just doing something. Do it is a continuation of doing. That's the suffix. So you, you continue to do. He said, not everyone said to me, Lord, Lord. Just because you can call on the Lord, Lord, Lord. Uh, no, no, no. And here's, here's the beauty of that. It's not coffee that keeps record, but it's God. Just because you can holler that, and unfortunately, some of us will be left in the dark. Because you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a period of reckoning when we die on that great, and we sing the song all the time, but we never teach it, never talk about it, you know, because we got a, most old school, but there's going to be a reckoning, time of reckoning. You didn't know that? And all of those things that we knew that God expected that we never done, they're going to come back. How many times we talk about, how many times does the Bible talk about, how many times does Jesus talk about visiting the sick? So, Cameron, you don't want to hear me? Can you see me? Well, act like nobody else to see me. You, can you show up? Okay. And, and you know what happened with those folk who were there on the day of reckoning, that, that the parable that's taught in Matthew? He said, uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. When I was sick, and then they, then they got amnesia. Lord, we, we didn't see you sick. When, Lord, when were you sick? I ain't even here, but nobody texts me. He said, depart from me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. Lord, we didn't know you was hungry. Lord, you were hungry. We didn't know. I, I, I say that in a facetious mode, but we got to be careful. That's walking circumspect. You, you, you got to be aware of those types of things, that those are going to come back to haunt you. 
Jesus even teaches in, in John chapter 12. He said, the very words I speak to you shall be the ones that judge you in the last. The very words. They ain't going to have to be coffee words. My words. And that's why I said, this is old school. We have to, every once in a while, you, you have to hear something like this. Now let me hustle. Lord have mercy. Hadn't got where I wanted to be yet. Mm. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. You were in five a minute ago. Brother, don't shake now because this ain't about husband and wife. But what does four say? Man, I got ten minutes. Okay. There is one body. Oh, you want to start at one or just verse four? Yeah. Twenty-four. Chapter four. Chapter verse. four, twenty-four. Yeah, I got you. Four twenty-four. And that he put on the new man. Which uh, after uh, God uh, is uh, uh, oh boy! Oh wait a minute! Now you you getting ready to you land? This is what God expects. He said that we do what? Put on the new man. What? What? So God expects us to change. Yes. He expects us to change. Well, I wonder why people go around. Well, the Lord know my heart. No, no, He expects you to change. That's just the way I am. No, the Lord knows that, but he wants you to change. Yeah, because we, we use that excuse. That's just the way I am. I'm just mean and nasty. That's just the way I am. Oh, well, you got to change. The Lord knows I'll cuss the Pope out. Well, you got to change. I mean, it's not me saying that. That's the scripture teaching that. So he he said you gotta he said you gotta put on the new man. Now you know what that here here's what here's what you you're not gonna get rid of if you got big feet you're gonna have big feet. That's just it. New man is a change of heart. This changes. This heart changes. And why is that important? Because this controls attitude, disposition, personality. This does. And so you've got to change that. And guess what? God expects you to. In fact, Jesus even talks about one of my favorite passages. You all know. In Matthew chapter 16 and the verse is 24. Jesus said, except the man Deny himself. That's tough doing. Self-denial is tough. Did you know that? He said, then pick up his cross and follow me. Now watch, watch, watch. Let's go, Camel. Our time is running out. And that he put on a new man. That he put is, on a new man. Which is after God is created, created righteous after God and in righteousness holiness. and holiness. Read. Wherefore, putting aside lying. Put aside, well, you know, it's, I just saying that I had nothing else to say. I didn't mean it. God expects me. He expects me to stop lying. Read, Camel. Speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are for we are members and one here, of another. And this is the reason. This is the this is the this is the key reason. Not only does God expect it, He said, but we need to learn to be honest with each other because we are members one of another. We're members one of another. We, we gotta treat each other the same. Treat folk like you want to be treated. You don't want somebody upstaging a highlight, don't you do it? Now, we can't see. You remember Jesus made that analogy? How can you see the moat in my eye? And you got a two by nine sticking out your eye. We, we always can fault sign. Let me go. My time is done. But this is what mercy, true mercy is about. I want to tell you this. 
every one of us here this morning, whether you admit it or not, we are living and need continuously extended to us the mercies of God. Now, some of you graduated. I know you don't need mercy anymore. But since I'm one of those creatures who still need mercy, I don't want you to ease up beside me if you don't need any. All of us need God's mercy. I don't care what you have, where you live, what you drive, what you got, because it's grace and mercy that extends our lives. I'm propped up this morning by his grace and his mercy. I got up this morning because of his mercy. It wasn't anything that I'd done that I deserved to have gotten up. But God's mercy, he extended to me. Now, I wish he extended to pain and suffering. But just because I can suffer and have pain, I've got to look at that differently, Kim. That's God's mercy. And we got to be compassionate. We got to think about others. We got to look for them. We got to learn to deal with them. Now, let me tell you something. With all of that, with all of that, some folks say, you say, oh, that, and I still go through having problems with enemies. You're going to have, hey, you're going to have them. Jesus was God's son, and there were folk that hated him. Anytime somebody died, and you got thieves that want to steal the body, they, they hate you. We are the children of God. And, so, and, and, and then one of the other things that's opening up is God has opened a window. He expects us to pass through. You know what I mean? We have to move. In our, in our relationship, we have to grow. We can't remain the same. You cannot, I cannot, none of us can be satisfied where we are spiritually. Some of us are not satisfied physically where we are. We're always trying to get ahead. Don't we, Bruce Smith? So you, so you shouldn't be satisfied spiritually. You shouldn't say, well, I'm a member of the body now and I found him, I found him, made it home. No, you have not arrived yet. You got to keep working. You got to keep praying. Till someday when God calls you from your labor to your reward, you will be prepared. But you're not there yet. And even though you and I are living in a different covenant that Michael wrote under, God expects the same for us. He expects us to be just. He expects us to show mercy. Some of us want mercy, but we don't want to show nobody no mercy. We want mercy. Oh, Lord, we'll run up and down, tell our best friend, you know, Camel wouldn't give me no mercy. And he wants us to walk humble. You know what humble is? Stay in your lane. Some folk won't be in every lane. You can't be in every lane. You, don't, you can't go up there on 295 and drive all over the road. Drive in the middle. Some of us do. I'm going to drive right in the middle. Slow up everybody. We, we do that in every fast of our life. We get in the church. I'm going to drive right in the middle. Ain't nobody going to go around me. Ain't no, I'm going to drive right, slow up. Every, get in your lane. Humble. You got to have a humble attitude. And you know what that means? Humbleness of mind means that you cannot wear your feelings on your wrist. Some of it where I feel like, oh, it's a wristwatch. You need know, bump it. He bumped my feeling. God expects that from us. If the church is going to blossom, and it, let me tell you something, it'll do it with or without you. 
all I'm simply saying is that each of us, from the preacher, the elder, to the ushers at the back door, we have to get prepare ourselves, and we prepare ourselves spiritually by studying and standing on God's word. Let's stop making excuses. Anybody can make excuses? Anybody can make excuses? Like, like, how many of y'all seen that, that guy on the, on the internet, 89-year-old black man that went and robbed the bank? Y'all see him? He went and robbed the bank, and his getaway car was a bicycle. He 89, he couldn't get, even get up on the thing. And when the police caught him, he said, if I could have got up on it. <laughs> That's an excuse for not making an exit. Some of us have the same mindset. We make so many flimsy excuses. What's your excuse this morning? Remember, I started out reading to you from Micah where God said, tell me what I did to make you feel that way. God said, tell me what I did. If you got a claim against me, file it. Tell me what I did to cause you to not worship. Tell me what I did to cause you not to serve. Tell me what I did to cause you not to be faithful, to make a commitment, to be accountable. God said, tell me what I did. Whatever I did, let me know personally. But if you don't have an excuse, then it's time for you to make it right with God. Tell me what I did that you didn't obey the truth when you heard it. When you heard that my son died for the church to give you a way to be reconciled back to me, tell me what I did to slow you up. Tell me what I did to stop you from obeying the gospel. But if you don't have an excuse, then you need to come to him this morning. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me share this. We don't know how much time is left. We can almost be a certain, though, that all of us, without the return of Jesus, have different amounts of time. Amen. It's winding up, brother. Brother Campbell, but unless now when Jesus comes, all of us that are left, he said, will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. But we don't know when time comes. What, what I will tell you is that I honestly want to be ready. I want to be ready. I, I can't say that I deserve it. But what I can say is I want to be ready. I don't know how long. Some days uh, I'll tell my wife this morning, I got up and, and I, wouldn't, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't own it. My hip wouldn't move. I said, I'm going to drag you along in when you better come on. <laughs> I got here to worship service. I, Stayed in my office because I didn't want to come out. I didn't want y'all to see me dragging. I had to get assistance from Sister Millie. Well, you got one of them 800. Let me have to put that book in my mouth. Straighten out. So we don't know when time is running enough. For sure, though, Jesus is coming again. And the Bible say, soon. And he says, that we need to make our peace calling an election sure. He's coming. He's not like he's not gonna be like us. When he starts, there won't be a delay. And so Paul writes in Thessalonica, he said, To you who are troubling, rest with us. Don't rest with them, rest with us. When Jesus should be revealed from heaven with his flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not Christ and who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't want to be in that. You don't want to be in that fix. And I would be afraid to be ashamed and ashamed to be afraid. 
I'd make that thing right. What you got to lose? Your whole life. Jesus made this analogy. He said, what if a man should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Wouldn't that be something? Or what would he give in change for his soul? I would not hold off. I would make it right. Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming home. It Come and let me tell you something. You cannot do it the wrong way. If you come and give your life to Jesus. Some folks say, well, what if I did that when I was young? No. When I say give your life to Jesus, I'm talking about what, would, what God expects. You hear his son, believe, repent of your sin, confess Jesus. And you put him on in the water of river baptism. That's how you put Jesus on is in baptism. Some folk are arguing with you. I put him on when I was young. If you were taught wrong, how could you put him on right? Right? They invited me down to the University of Florida tomorrow. and said, Mr. Coffey, we're going to want you to be the professor of trigonometry. Man, I can't even spell trigonometry. I barely get around with two plus two. You want me doing all that other stuff? I can't work with that. If you were taught wrong, you can't be baptized right. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, I'm through. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not as so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death. He says, therefore we are buried with him. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should rise to do what? Walk in a new life. You can do that this morning. If you're here, we're going to ask you to come. Come. Come while we stand. Richard.